Hi, Andrew Henderson, University of Texas School of Public Health. Um, I'd like to hear all your perspectives on spatial and temporal removal. So Stanley, you're talking about moving things in space, and to me it's not entirely clear that if, if something is evapotranspirated, it leaves the area. And, and uh, Katie, you're talking about holding things in time, and which also doesn't clearly mean that it's leaving the area. And uh, Carrie, you probably have perspectives on how this plays out in real life. So any comments on that? I know it's a big question, but you can have short answers. Okay, I'll give it a go first. I, I think um, in terms of uh, producing uh, and consuming agricultural commodities, what we are saying here is uh, not everything that is produced in a certain area is actually consumed in that area. So the key is uh, trying to trace the movement of those commodities between areas of production and areas of consumption. But obviously through trade data that happens, you know, through trade that happens between regions, we know that not everything that is produced in Texas is actually consumed there. Some of it, it ends up being consumed in New York. But we have to be able to trace those pathways to know where it went. Well, geographers think about space a lot. Um, and I think, as this study shows, even within the US, there's a high degree of variegation and kind of spatial you know, difference in and among you know, the, the US, which we traditionally hold up as like um, uh, the model for water management around the world. Um, I think the more interesting questions come along with, you know, around scale and spatial scale and regulation. Like, what are the sort of barriers for upscaling um, practices like this, as well as what would be the barriers, you know, what are kind of impacts emerge when you downscale things like climate variability and long-term future climate scenarios, because you know, once you sort of put more responsibility, for example, in a bunch of households managing water in, in lieu of the state or in concert with the state, then um, new kind of vulnerabilities and adaptive mechanisms emerge when you kind of downscale to a smaller, finer grain prediction. So I think there's still a lot to learn and a lot of questions there um, when we're thinking about integrative res water resources management around the issues of space and scale. Thanks. I think it's a good question because I think um, with um, integrated water resource management and, and um, conservation, I think the timing and um, spatial aspects are really key. And there's some of the things that kind of get um, brushed over. For example, you know, we're thinking about some of the um, agricultural best management practices. You know, um, we just saw a presentation earlier today. I don't think he's still here, but um, about you know, if you implement um, sprinkler irrigation, you move from flood to sprinkler, uh, you assume that that's a good thing. But you know, when you start thinking about the timing of the water movement and how if you have flood irrigation, you might actually be um, you know, creating uh, water later into the season by letting it infiltrate. And it might be cooler water that goes back to the stream. I think that there are a lot of complications around the timing and the movement of water um, that you need to understand when you're thinking about how to address some of these challenges. Um, as well as a lot of our study, like for the study I put up there about um, the water balance globally, that's just looking annually. But there, it, you know, it's more important to look monthly what's happening in the dry seasons and how that how climate change is going to impact that. Um, so I think it's a really important question about the time and space in terms of water management. I'm a PhD student at MIT. The, I have a question for Katie. Um, you mentioned rebates as part of infrastructure. Um, and I'm wondering if you included stormwater utilities, rebates that people get for off of the amount that they have to pay in the stormwater utility, um, or whether that's you're sort of considering that as something that's conceptually different than the type of water rights you're talking about. Because it's a little bit different in that a stormwater utility is a tax that you pay for the for your use of the stormwater utility, or the stormwater system, whereas you were sort of talking, at least in the case of Colorado, as um, your sort of capture of water for that people could be using downstream. So I just wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, we looked at any sort of, if it was linked, some if some if in some cases the legislation between active rainwater harvesting and stormwater 
harvesting was linked. And so in that case, we did count that in there. Um, some of these were state level things. Some of these were rebates from uh, dis utility districts, for example. But if it was just sort of like build a berm and basin in your front yard or a bioswale, we did not look at those because we, we wanted to really focus on active rainwater harvesting for, for household use. Maybe not drinking, although in some cases, apparently you can, Texas and Ohio. So um, we weren't as interested in the stuff that just kind of collects and then sinks right back into the, mainly because we're interested in the direct appropriation of something. In a way, these households become kind of mini utilities, you know, ca capturing water straight from the sky and kind of managing it. And, you know, what are the kind of spatial problematics of governing all these different people doing these things, um, I think is the, what we're after. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, Rick Cruz, Iowa State. Um, many of the BMPs, particularly the two that talked about uh, ag, are, are well targeted for people that own and manage their lands because they have long-term economic value. The majority of our ag land, both in this country and, and, and variety of the other countries in the world, the majority of the land is rented. How do you incentivize individuals that have management rights for short time periods to use the type of practices that, that we consider BMPs? It's, it's a really good question. It's something that, um, yeah, it's something that we definitely encounter. Um, in the U.S. and in other countries, such as in the Tana River Basin and other places. Um, in, in those cases, it's a, it's a really big challenge because it's not that long-term investment. You know, there's not this, um, there's not this ability to, to, even if they wanted to install a better irrigation system, you know, there's no guarantee they're going to be able to use that system in perpetuity. So there might not be that return investment that they're looking for. Um, so in those cases, um, it's, it's really challenging to get, to get um, those folks uh, on board. Most of the um, farmers we work with in North America have are um, landowners or long-term renters where they know they have the land for 50 years or something like that. Um, and so it, it's a really big challenge to try to get to, to those um, short-term um, growers. So, and I'd love if you have any, <laughs> any experience or um, any uh, um, you know, uh, feedback on that. I'd definitely love to talk. <laughs> okay, I think uh, with that, we're, uh, let's give another round of applause to our panel. <laughs> <laughs>